just the submissions to make you feel good and just to be saved. If they reject or deny Christ, they have not the Father. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, has eternally existed with God. Because if God is with us, who can be against us? Saints Ministries. Today is Sunday, October 18, 2020. We want to continue with our new mini-series titled The World, The War of World Views. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, we want to read verses 1 and 2. And after that, we'll be turning our Bibles to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And we'll read considerable portion of scripture there. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, we'll read down to verse 24. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. Amen. Today we want to preach from the topic, Christianity, a biblical world view. Amen. Father, we give thanks for the word of God and for the message for your people today. And I pray that you give me grace and wisdom and all sensibility and all sensitivity to the message and to the people of God. And as, it, as I stand before your presence, the presence of all the holy angels and your holy saints, I ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with me and bless me and prosper me in the dispensing of this message today in the spirit of the ministry of Christ as we preach the word of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that this word would so minister to the minds of your people and so encourage and strengthen your people, equip your people to be a powerful and a mighty seed and the minds of your people that would grow and blossom and become a strong tree in their thoughts and in their thinking. Use this message today, O oh Lord, to give your people critical understanding of what is critical for the people of God to know and understand in this time as we live in the evil day and the day of ideas. We give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen. We want to talk about the War of Worldviews. That is what this new mini-series is titled. And I want to begin today's message with this concise preface before we get further along into the message for today. And the first thing that I want to say 
to the body of Christ is that world views matter. World views matter. They are critically important to be understood. Within every worldview are embedded ideas and beliefs. And ideas have consequences. And this is something that the Church of Jesus Christ needs to know. It's something that humanists understand. It's something that Marxists understand. But it's not something that Christians understand. Ideas have consequences. And ideas have lasting influence as well as lasting effects on not just individuals, but entire societies. Men have died and men have been in their graves for hundreds and thousands of years, but their ideas and their influence are still with us. A couple of weeks ago, we began this mini-series, and as I mentioned then, this series is something that's near and dear to me and has been on my heart for a very long time. It's something I believe is critically important for Christians to understand, to know, and to possess. And we ask the question, what is a worldview? In essence, a worldview is one's view of the world. It's the grid the framework, and the lens through which we interpret, understand, and see the world, as well as the meaning and purpose of life. It informs what we believe, it governs how we live, and it explains how and why we act the way we do. It's a particular perspective. It's a way of making sense of the world. For the Christian, and the Christian worldview, we have a very clear and specific understanding or perspective of the world and why the world is in the state that it's in and why man is in the condition that he is in. Again, it's for this reason that we as Christians need to grasp the critical importance of knowing, understanding, and having a distinctly biblical or Christian worldview. We need to have a clear understanding of what God has said about the world, about life, and about the four mentioned arenas or ten disciplines, particularly in light of other world views. We mentioned that Christianity is one among many competing world views. We also need to know what these other competing world views are and what they believe as it accounts for why they hold the positions they hold and why they do what they do. I mentioned last week that it's because of a particular worldview that individuals hold, but particularly legislators, as to why they legislate the laws that they do. Sometimes we come to the knowledge of a particular piece of legislation and we scratch our heads and we go, how in the world could they ever come to that kind of law. How could they ever pass that kind of law? That law is inconceivable. But legislators can pass the pieces of law that they do with the nature and content of them because of a particular worldview that they hold to. Our worldviews directly impact how and what we think about critical questions and issues such as what does it mean to be human? One of the biggest, one of the most important, one of the critical questions being asked today is what does it mean to be human? Who has the right to life? Who has the right to live? As Americans, there was a time that we never thought that we would be asking or be wrestling or struggling with this fundamental question of who has the right to life or who has the right to live and who has the authority to decide on such a critical question. What is the biblical definition of marriage? What is the biblical view of the biblical understanding of the nuclear family? And these are crucial questions to the church because the church doesn't know the answer to these questions. And in far too large of segments of the church, we have compromised 
we have made concessions on these crucial questions. And we have changed our answers to these questions and answers that are conforming to the prevailing culture. What is the basis for morals and ethics? Meaning, what's the basis for determining what is right and what is wrong? What is the basis for determining what is good and what is evil? Because we live in a day now where the lines have been blurred and there's no longer any distinction between right and wrong, good and evil. If it makes you feel good, then do it, is the rationale. Whose responsibility is it to educate our children? And the greatest war, perhaps, that we are engaged in today in our nation is the war over who has the right to educate our children. What is the basis and proper role of government? This is a big question facing us now, as we have experienced government overreach since COVID like we've never experienced it before. And we have to ask the question and answer the question, what is the proper role and function of government? <clears throat> and we have to take issue with this because God has given government. God has ordained government. Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 13. In fact, in Timothy, he says, pray that people come into office that will lead to you leading and living a peaceful life in Christ. But we have disconnected. We have, we have no concern for politics and government. And then people get into office that are or hold to a worldview that is antithetical or in opposition to our worldview. And we cry, what is going on? Because we have taken no legitimate or real or meaningful interest in politics or the role and function of government. What is economics and which form promotes private property and freedom? These are critical and crucial questions that need to be answered, and they need to be answered properly. And we as Christians need to know what the answers to these questions are. <clears throat> we haven't concerned ourselves with a biblical worldview or these crucial questions because these things have been shoved to the sideline as unimportant because they don't make us feel good. We live in a day and time and have for a generation or more where what we've focused on from our pulpits and our churches are the things that make us feel good. The things that make us feel better about ourselves. And God does care about us, but the emphasis and the focus is not about us feeling good about ourselves. Paul said to the Ephesians that truth is in Jesus. But we have taken truth and we have suppressed it and we made Jesus our cosmic bellhop. We haven't concerned ourselves about the truth that is in Jesus. But we've concerned ourselves with the blessings that are in Jesus. The prosperity that's in Jesus. <clears throat> From these few questions, it becomes clear that worldviews matter. As Christians, we need to have a biblical view of all these issues and provide biblical answers to all these questions. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, as we've read, Paul wrote these words to the Roman Christians to admonish them, to encourage them, exhort them, as also to command them to not be pressed, molded into, or shaped by the prevailing ethos or pathos of Roman culture. In other words, Paul commanded them not to be influenced by and won over to the values, morals, and beliefs of the Roman culture, the prevailing attitudes <coughs> and habits of Rome in the first century. He also commanded them not to give in to the sentimentality of the culture, to be careful to not be swayed by an appeal to their emotions but to exercise logic, reason, and rationality. Amen. Amen. We don't understand these philosophical things because we think philosophy has no place in the Christian church. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Because if we remember in classical times, theology was considered the head and the queen of the sciences, and philosophy was considered her handmaiden. 
But now we live in a day where philosophy has been placed above theology. And we've made theology our God. And unfortunately we have a faulty understanding of philosophy or we are disinterested in it as a science altogether. So the church as in general doesn't concern itself with the crucial issue and matter of philosophy. Because philosophy has to do with thinking, how we think, why we think. Why do we think what we think or the way we think? How did we come to this, the system of belief or the knowledge that we have? Because all of us, whether we identify it or not, not only embrace a particular worldview of some sort or some smorgasbord of a worldview, but we embrace a philosophy of some sort. Paul here, in writing to the Romans, he makes a clear distinction between ethos, pathos, and logos. Like the Christians in Rome in the first century, we as Christians in America in the 21st century cannot give in to the predominant ethos or the prevailing pathos of the culture. Like the Christians <coughs> in Rome, we must embrace the logos, the logic, reason, and rationality of the Christian worldview which is rooted in God's divine revelation. Again, the Word of God as God's divine revelation is critical to the Christian having a biblical worldview. We must look at, interpret, and understand the universe, the world, man, and life through the lens of Holy Scripture. Far too often and for far too long, we've not understood Christianity as a worldview. And we haven't understood that the Word of God sets forth the worldview for the Christian. And we've limited our view and understanding of God's Word. And we've assigned to it just some pragmatic meaning. Meaning we just look in the Word of God for things that will work for us. Right, right. But the Word of God sets forth a very clear and comprehensive worldview or view of life. It explains why life is the way it is. And how life is supposed to be lived as God intended it. I've often asked this question. How could Christians hold on to Christ with one hand and hold on to Marx with the other? And the reason is because they don't have a distinctly biblical or Christian world view. And they don't understand the Marxian worldview with its inevitable results. Again, they love Christ with their hearts but not with their minds. They love him with their feelings and emotions, but not with their thinking and their intellect. With their minds, they hold to Marx. And not even knowingly, they, they don't identify it. And because we don't have a basis for discernment, we don't identify or recognize the fact that we are holding on to Marx in principle. Or in practice. As we looked at Peter so many times over the years in Matthew 16, Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be crucified. And Peter steps in front of him and says, no, Lord, that will never happen to you. I will not allow that to happen to you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. So Peter, as an apostle of Christ, stood with Christ in principle. But he stood with Satan in practice. And that's where many churches and believers are in today's culture. Because we, we have received Christ in our heart. But we have received the thinking of the world in our minds. And this is why Paul said it is, he gives it as a command to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, changing the old principles and thoughts and belief systems of the mind that comes from Adam, the dead sarcophagus. So in essence, what we do every day is we go dig Adam up out of his grave as a sarcophagus and we carry him on our back. And we consult with Adam in his deadness, in his fallenness, and in his faulty reasoning and say, Adam, what do you think about this? But we don't say, Christ, Lord Jesus, what do you think about this? 
We talk about having the mind of Christ, but we really don't understand what we mean when we say that. And we don't understand what the Bible means when the Bible says that. To be thinking Christ's thoughts after him. The only way that the believers and the church can think like Christ or think his thoughts after him is that we have to be well versed in the word of God. The word of God is the thought of God. Yes, sir. God has spoken very clearly and very definitively and very comprehensively on all the matters and issues that we're discussing. We tend to think that God has no position on philosophy, failing to realize that God is the ultimate transcendent and greatest philosopher. God is the greatest thinker. No man who has ever come into the world has thought anything without God having first thought it or given it to him to think. Yes, sir. This is why John says in chapter 1 of his gospel that Jesus lights every man that comes into the world. What he means is Jesus enlightens, gives every man the ability to think and to think rationally. But men choose to think irrationally. And it's easy to do that because man is fallen. We were talking in our leadership meeting about the fact that you can be truly born again but you can be woefully ignorant when it comes to the things of God. Your thinking could be all messed up. But you could be loving Christ. This is why the study of God's word is important because one of the things we've said a long time ago. To study the word of God is to study theology which is to study God. And to study God informs our worship. We can't truly worship God in spirit and truth if we don't know him. If we don't know what God thinks and what God has said, we can't really truly worship him in spirit and truth. Because the mind has not been transformed or renewed. Our worship is limited for that reason. Because worship is not just, Lord, I love you. Worship is how we think about God. How we allow our minds to be used and our thought process to be used to glorify God. This is why God said to Israel, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your spirit, and your mind. God, the mind, is important to God. If God has a mind and is a thinking God, then how much more should those who are in his image have a mind and be thinking. Amen, amen, amen. And to think his thoughts after yes, him. Lord. What I found over the years are two things. One, people simply haven't been introduced to this or exposed to this, or people are just too lazy to do the work. That's right. That's right. We don't want to study the things that are too hard for us, that require more time. Because after all, if I take time to study a Christian worldview or theology, then that takes time away from me watching my TV shows. All right. Lord, I'll do it after this, and then hours pass by, and then it's time to go to bed. And we get in the bed, and we lay our heads on the pillow and say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Karl Marx was an evil genius, though not entirely of himself. His dialectic was brilliant rooted in a dark wisdom, the source of which is Satan. He was able to successfully join together the thesis and the antithesis, or the antithesis, and produce a synthesis, or synthesis. In other words, he was able to successfully join Christianity and Marxism, or socialism, and produce socialized Christians. Christians who worship Christ with their mouths, but walk with Marx in their politics and economics. Right. That's right. This is a serious matter in the church today. Many label this phenomenon as progressive Christianity. Or the Christian left. That's right. <laughs> Oxymoronic. Mm -hmm. Not possible. Wow. That's a mutation, mm -hmm. and it is a disgust and a disdain to Christ. It is a foreign thing to Christ. It's a strange thing to Christ. James said, how can sweet water 
and bitter water come out of the same fountain. So how can the Christian embrace Christ and Karl Marx at the same time? This is oxymoronic. But somehow, Marx in his dark wisdom brilliantly accomplished this. So that we say, I love Jesus for him, I'll live and I'll die. But when it comes to politics and economics, I'm down with Karl Marx. Because I believe that I should be given stuff. I believe in the welfare state. Come on. I don't I I believe that the government should have more control in the life of every American citizen. I believe the government should make these crucial decisions for me as a believer and for every American citizen. I, I believe in Joe Biden and the Democratic Party platform. I believe in Kamala Harris and, and her, what she has to say about politics and life and abortion and all these other matters. These things are an affront and an offense to Christ. And as Christians, we need to know where Christ and his word stands on these matters. Life is sacred. And the government doesn't have the right to decide who has to live, has the right to live or to take life away. Yes, That's not the government's yes. role or yes, function sir. or responsibility yes, or right. Amen. But you have Christians lining up on that side. Mm -hmm. Forgive them, Lord. Yes, forgive them, Lord. Paul said, don't be pressed, molded into a shape by the ethos or pathos of the society or the culture. And yet, Christians are. And we'll fight over it. Fight for it. We'll fight other Christians that they disagree with on these crucial life view matters or issues. God said, understanding the creation and its purpose and its proper function and relationship he said, man should not man with, lie with man and woman should yes, lie sir. with woman. Yes, sir. That's because right. it's a gross violation mm -hmm. of my creation order and purpose for them. Yes, sir. It, it, it violates my design for them, mm -hmm. which is a divine design. That's right. my God. It fulfills my divine purposes. Mm -hmm. And you have Christians lining up on this side saying, Lord, I don't care about your creation order. I don't care about your divine design. People have the right to do what they want to do, Lord. And who are you to tell them what they can and cannot do? This is the spirit and attitude of Christians today. Christians line up on the side of governments that are opposed to God and opposed to the Christian worldview. Paul said, don't give in to your feelings. Don't be swayed in your emotions because of the cultural sentiment or arguments. Know what God has said and stand with God. Yeah. Moses stood in the gate and said, who's on the Lord's side? Everyone who's on God's side, come stand here with me. If the Moses was to come today and say that, there would be few that would come and stand with Moses. They would say, Moses, I know who you think you are. I'm grown, Moses. I can do what I want. You don't tell me what to do. You don't tell me what to do with my body. This is my body. No, it's God's body. Yes, sir. The body yes. and the soul belongs to Christ alone. And only he has the authority to determine what is to be done with that body. Amen. It's not our body. Yes, it's not. The spirit that lives in this body is a, is, has been given a stewardship over this body. Yes, sir. This body is to be treated like a temple. And we have sought a coup. To overthrow the government of Christ. We don't want him to rule over us. It's funny because we always say he's my master and my king and my lord. But we don't want him to rule over us. We have the audacity in the church to have a spirit and attitude to say things like, Lord, who do you think you are? This is why Jesus said in that day, many will come and call me and say, Lord, Lord. Yeah, but he's going to say, that. I never say that. knew you. That's right. Depart from me. Right. Who are you? Hallelujah. I did this, Lord, in your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you never loved me. Mm -hmm. 
you never repented of your sins. You never submitted to my lordship. You did what you did for your own benefit and convenience. You did what you did out of selfish <coughs> ambition because you wanted to be seen. It was never about me. It was about you. It was about getting pats on your back and getting props for yourself. I never knew you. When you came to my house, you came in the spirit of a facade. You just came to be seen and to make a scene. You just came to be heard. But you never heard my voice. Because your voice was louder than mine. So they label this phenomenon as progressive Christianity. This is an oxymoron. This is a complete antithesis. For sake of time, we'll stop there. And we'll come back next week and we'll continue with this message. I want to say something. Some Sundays, because of the Spirit of the Lord on me, I'm intense. And there's good reason for it. I usually take the posture of the Spirit as He comes on me. So if I seem intense and short, it's not to be personal or offensive. Just the Spirit of the Lord is on me in such a way that there's no time for foolish play. Amen. Amen. This is a very serious hour. Amen. We are losing the war. Amen. The watchmen have been on their towers crying to the, to the church, but the church cannot hear. If you were able to see in the spirit, you would see a remnant of watchmen. You would see a remnant of leaders on the front line <clears throat> staving off and holding back the hordes of hell. Looking back and seeing this city full of lights and sound and celebration and revelry. And because of their own noise, their own clamor, they cannot hear the voices of the watchmen calling out to them. They have no idea that the enemy has not only encroached and surrounded the church, but has infiltrated the church, has entered into the sanctuary of God. And many churches, many Christians in churches who are asleep, many pastors and shepherds who are asleep have received them with warm welcomes. Paul said there should be such power in our churches that when the wicked, the ungodly, the unsaved, and the pagan come in, they should be completely disturbed and disrupted in their spirit. They should be bothered. Homosexual men should not be in God's church hugging each other. Lesbian women should not be sitting in the congregation of the Lord hugging each other. They shouldn't be in the choir. If they are not regenerate, if they are not born again, if they are not saved, if they have not repented, they should not serve in any department or auxiliary in Christ's church. Yes, sir. Yes. It's the truth. This tolerance has gone too far. I feel the wrath and the anger of God. <clears throat> because we have played with Christ. We have played church. And you know what? We've been praying. We've been fasting. We had a solemn assembly. And we've been asking God to have mercy in the midst of his, in his wrath. And I believe he will. But right now the spirit of God on me. Oh my God. Oh, there's an anger in heaven. There's an anger in heaven. If Christ was not standing, 
and making intercession. Amen. Mm. Yes. Mm. My God. Oh, Lord, My thank God. you. Thank if we can see you. in heaven, we see Father, the Jesus. cup of America, but specifically the cup of the church filled. And we can see the Father, and we see Jesus holding his hand back. My Lord. Give them a little more time, Father. Have mercy, Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hold the cup of your wrath for a little bit longer. Let, give me some more time to pray for my church, Father. Before you pour out your cup. Yes, sir. People are playing around. People are playing games. People are still sneaking still. and dipping and slipping. Still. People are still trying to do still. things in under the cover of darkness. Mm -hmm. Ministers are still doing things. Oh, and they think it's in secret. Mm -hmm. But everything ain't exposed before him who sees all, who's nothing escapes his gaze. Yes. We've been saying just a, just a little bit more, Lord. Just, a little, just let me sin a little bit more. Just let me sin a little while longer. And then I'll finally finish and get it right. I'll finally stop. <clears throat> There's been a season in which he has winked. But now he demands repentance or wrath. Yes, sir. Oh, for 20 years... The watchmen have been calling the church to repentance, warning the church that judgment is about to begin in the house of God. And we haven't taken heed. We haven't taken heed. We haven't taken it serious. Because the Bible says when God does not execute his judgment upon sin and wickedness speedily, people persist in their ways. Because they think God will not judge them. Right. This was the spirit and attitude of, Ju of Judah for years. God doesn't see. God doesn't hear. He doesn't know. God doesn't care. He's indifferent to my sin. And the church has been doing the same thing today. The church. Oh, Father, Father, we really need God to have mercy. Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. There is a stench. There is a stench that has gone up before the throne of God. God is like, oh. And the angels are like, whoa. What is that? Where is that coming from? And they look down over the precipice of heaven and say, my church? That's my church smelling like that? Like the world? Worse than the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you knew the sins that were committed in the church, both the physical church and the universal, the spiritual church, Ah, shoot. I'm, I'm, in, I'm already in trouble. I'm in it now. The molestation. Ministers molesting the children in the church. The ministers worshiping two gods. Worshiping the God of Scripture and then trying to worship the God of Freemasonry. Stench, corruption, perversion. The idolatry in the church has reached a level that God can bear it no longer. The harlotry in the church has reached a level that God can bear it no longer. He said, I see my remnant. I see my faithful. I will pass over them. But for those who refuse to repent... They will meet my judgment without mitigation. And God's going to get so many leaders, so many ministers. There are many who have entered into unequally yoked covenants. Unholy covenants, unholy alliances. There are pastors that have made deals with political leaders. That's evil. 
that's dark, that's wicked, <coughs> because they benefit, because something gets placed in their pockets mm -hmm. at the expense of the sheep, not only the sheep in the church, but the sheep in the city. Ministers that have made deal with Rome. That have said, I won't expose Rome. If I can benefit from it. Or Rome has come to the Protestant church and said, if you will be quiet and not expose me. I will make you a beneficiary of some things. And ministers have said, okay. I'll take the deal. I'll enter into an unholy covenant with you. Oh, I see the hand writing on the wall again. You have been tried and found wanting. And even after God revealed that to Belshazzar, he was frightened for but a moment and went right back to reveling and worshiping the gods of gold and silver and stone and wood. And God smote him that night. Oh. God said, I will do all these things because my people do not fear me. It's one thing for the heathen not to fear God. But for those who are his people not to fear him. Because the world has been looking at the, the church and saying, look at your skirts. You got blood in your skirts too, church. I smell the scent and fragrance of adultery on you too, church. I see your idolatry too. You can't tell me how to live when you aren't living that way, church. Speak, Pastor, speak. Speak, Lord. The Lord will not suffer this duplicity. He will not allow us to have two masters. He's a jealous God and rightly so. El Elkanah. I am the Lord your God and I am a jealous God. And he has the right to be jealous because he made us in his image and for his glory. And he redeemed us to himself and made us a people. Revealed himself, gave us his covenant, gave us his word. And said, be holy because I'm holy. Mm -hmm. And be my ambassadors, my representatives to the nations yes, around me. Yes. But how can we if we're engaged in the same devilment as the world? Father, the church has sinned. Your leaders have sinned. Many of your leaders have become hirelings because they've made deals and they've taken payment not to preach the truth, the unadulterated truth, not to preach against sin. Not to expose that which is false, but to tolerate, to be complicit, agreeable to that which is sinful, that which is evil, that which is wrong. Father, I do pray and ask that you forgive us, but God, when you send a word like this, when you send a warning and a message like this, you are calling us to repentance. Yes. And if we don't repent and the window is closing and it's nearly shut, Amen. you are giving us <clears throat> a short window of time to get it right. 
If we don't, we will suffer your judgment. And I hear the objections out there. My God doesn't judge. He said, I am the judge of all the nations, and I will judge all the people of the earth. And everyone will stand before the seat of judgment to be judged for the deeds done in their bodies and for the words that they have spoken and for their idleness. He declared himself to be the judge, and yet we try to change him, the immutable one. And we say to him, God, you're not a judge. You won't judge. You're loving. Because we don't know God. Yes. The God we're worshiping, the God that we're talking about is a God we've created in our own image and after our likeness. He has the stamp of fallen man on him. Isaiah said, you, listen, I'm not like you, but you think I'm like you. My ways are so high. I'm so transcendent. I'm so holy. I'm so morally perfect and so morally pure. My perfection is so perfectly perfect. <laughs> My purity is so purely pure. We can't fathom him. We can't fathom him. He's holy. He's just and he's righteous. And he must judge sin or else he is not God. Thank you, Lord. We're in a moment. We're in a moment which closely parallels many things in the biblical narratives. But we're in a moment that is getting close to the Mount Carmel moment. When Elijah took on Jezebel, that witch, and her 850 false prophets. Elijah's name means who is God. And in the spirit of Elijah, the prophetic voice that comes to the church today to ask us, who is God in your life? Is it a God that you made an idol of the mind, of the soul, of the desire, of the emotions, the kind of God you want to be in your life, one that you can control? who really doesn't have lordship over you? Almost like the mythological gods of the Greeks and the Romans. The creation of man's imagination. Or am I God? God of gods, Lord of lords, king of kings, ruler of rulers, judge of judges. Who is God? We're coming to a moment like Mount Carmel. God is asking his church, and he's saying to his church, if I am God, then serve me. But if your idols, the things you have made with your hands and made with your imagination, if they are gods, then serve them. But you cannot serve both. And when his judgment falls, no created or imagined idol can stop it or protect us from it. I don't care how we declare that my God doesn't judge. I don't care how strong and staunchly we stand and our opinion on that. God is going to judge everything and everybody.
<laughs> My final word. to the church is that your God for your sake better be the true and living God. Yes, yeah. sir. Amen. That's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it. The one who dwells in unapproachable light mm -hmm. full of glory, yes. splendor, yes. and majesty. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Who is the judge of all the earth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. And if he isn't your God, you don't repent. Jesus said to them, when the tower fell on the people and killed them, he said, unless you repent, mm. you shall likewise Never. perish. Mm. Right. Know the Spirit of God right now. Have a strong sense of the presence of God right now. Every now and then, the Lord visits us in such a way that it is solemn. Out of awe and reverence, respect and honor for the Lord who is on his throne. As we dismiss, let us be silent before him. And let us simply meditate on the words that he has spoken to us this day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 Thank you were dismissed.